Now I gotta confess that I wasn't vibing as much with Dynamite this week. And, and maybe that's just thinking about other things, having other concerns, being kind of tired when I sat down and watched it Wednesday night. Like those types of things can impact your viewing experience more than anything that a company actually does with their product, with their show. It's kind of the reality. Now I also say that sometimes it's key for me to remember that not every show needs to have something great in every single segment. And you're just not going to get that. It's just not realistic. It's just not going to happen. You know, some weeks will be better than others. Some segments will be better than others. And this week I think was a perfect example of it. And if I, if I had to be honest, like most of the show, like I appreciate what they were trying to go for in terms of long-term uh, storyline development. Certainly something I thought at the very beginning of AEW that was missing in a lot of ways. Here, I feel like they're emphasizing more of the storytelling elements, which certainly resonates with me better. Uh, but some of those storytelling elements, like there's one thing to try and tell a story. It's another thing is the story being told in an interesting, captivating way. Is it something that's going to hook me in? And then, you know, sometimes when you look at some of these shows and you see these matches and some of these matches just go way too long, kind of kills it. But if I had to go through some of what happened on this show to get to the main event and get to that parking lot fight, then it was certainly worth it. Now we kicked off in big style. It's FTR taking on my boys, the Jurassic Express and the Lucha Freaking Source in a non-title match, of course, because there is an anti-dinosaur conspiracy. What in the flat earth is going on here, you asteroid humpers? Give them a title shot. Them stupid rankings don't matter any other time. And the young bucks, how dare they show up and interrupt the festivities before they even get started? I guess their motto is going to be now: it's an elite thing to do is to arrive, super kick, and leave. And you know what? I will agree. The bucks always have gotten under my skin. They annoy the hell out of me. I do not like them. I'm not fans of them. I think the worship of them amongst the hardcore wrestling fans is rather ridiculous. In some ways, they're a representation of things that are wrong with professional wrestling. But if you're telling me that you're going down to this path that they're going to be kind of they're going to be more snarky and more jerkish and kind of cockish, like that works better for them. I am much more interested in that than the young bucks that we're supposed to pretend like we're supposed to be good guys and we're supposed to like. We shouldn't. We should not. They are not that likable. So I can get down with that. As far as this match, it was good. It wasn't as good as the pay-per-view match that Jurassic Express had, ironically enough, with the Bucks. But it was good. You know, can't, can't we guy throw these guys a, a freaking bone here and let them win one? Yeah. Sometimes it would be nice to see this tag team that has some potential, actually get over on some folks and actually win some goddamn matches. That's all I'm saying. And uh, then you cut over to Matt Hardy apparently being laid out backstage and you see Chris Jericho's walking up to him and talking about he's at not having the best of luck today and he has a bat in his hand. It'd be even better if it wasn't Matt Hardy that attacked him and that it was, or it wasn't that Chris Jericho that attacked him. It was somebody else totally and completely unrelated. It'd be really cool if it was Rebbe and said, Whack! You ain't going out there tonight! <laughs> Although I want to point out, like he was talking about he's going to take time off to go get himself right because he wasn't cleared. So why is he there? Just, just ask. Uh, then we go to Hangman Page versus Kazarian. And Omega on commentary was a good, necessary touch. You know, I, I like the dynamic of him talking about Hangman Page and talking about their history while this match is going on. But this match, to me, was just a little too much on the long side. Like, as a singles guy, where, where Page is supposed to be and where Kazarian is supposed to be are two different levels. Hangman Page shouldn't have to be working this competitive of a match and going this long with a dude like Kazarian. And I understand maybe what you're trying to paint here in terms of the picture and what you're trying to sell with Kenny Omega and Hangman Page and the beef between these two guys. Uh, but you probably could have done it in a crisper fashion. Just because you can have a match go X number of minutes doesn't mean you always need to. Sometimes it could go Y, and that's just fine. Oh, for Christ's sake, when that goddamn phone stop ringing, you would think after all these years, they would know. If I ain't paid the bill by now, I'm not going to now. Statute of limitations, mother -uppers. Seriously. I mean, 
and beyond that. Why the hell would I even have a house phone? Like, how stupid do you have to be to buy into some triple play package where they stick you with this house phone that you don't like and you never use, and yet some reason, like an idiot, you continue to keep hooked up? I don't know. Completely unrelated. But stop calling this goddamn house. Especially when 90% of the calls aren't even for you. You know what I mean? Anyways, moving on. MJF quickly dispatched of the nobody Sean Dean. I mean that disrespectfully, I'm just saying, like, this is MJF for crying out loud. What else would he do? And, and it is important to call out that from here on going forward, until told otherwise, by our hero and savior, the true babyface MJF, that we are to refer to him as the undefeated, undisputed, uncrowned AEW world champion of all elite wrestling. Like, he even nails the Department of Redundancy Department stuff here. Just fan. Fantastic. Anytime you give me a show that gives me a few minutes of MJF on the mic, I'm good. Like, you know, I'm a bigger mark for the characters and the stories and the promos and the moments than I am the moves and the matches anyways. That's, that's always been my deal. And, and a guy like him, like, he is just so smooth. He is just so smooth. I enjoy the ever-loving hell out of it. I even like the little vignette they did with... Uh, Taz doing the voiceover talking about Ricky Starks. It, it's kind of ironic to me that you're talking about somebody that's supposed to be technically an NWA wrestler, but he's here in AEW, or is he now just full-time AEW? Then Taz is doing the voiceover. I, I don't really know. Like, I'm still trying to get caught up from taking a couple months away from wrestling. Um, I like Ricky Starks here better in AEW, though, because I think he has a better purpose. In NWA, I could see it, but it wasn't there, if that makes sense. Like, you could see the flashes and you could see the potential, but he, he felt like a character that didn't have direction. Here, I feel like he most certainly does. Uh, speaking of not really having a direction, I look at what was going on with the Eddie Kingston promo and all the family. And props to him on the Bo Nose jersey. Like that Bo Jackson, number 16, KC Royals jersey. Fantastic. And typically, I would talk about anytime you put a live microphone in, tight, in front of Eddie Kingston, you get a couple of minutes of potentially really good entertaining wrestling programming. But this promo in this segment was just weird. Like he's talking about, again, he brings up the fact that, you know, continuity Kingston, that he never was a thrown over the top rope. He was never eliminated in the Casino Battle Royal, but he's done absolutely nothing about that. Like, I'm sorry, but to me, if I'm supposed to take you seriously, like, that should be your obsession. You should be consumed by it. It should be everything to you, is that you're basically getting screwed out of what could potentially be argued as a chance to get a number one title shot, you know, against Moxley. Like, I'm not really following this. I'm not sure what the point is of doing the whole beatdown segment with the family, having the Butcher and the Blade go out and pull in some other wrestlers from the crowd. I just, it's weird. Like, Eddie Kingston on Mike, cool. Last couple of weeks, what they've done with it, eh, not so much. What else is kind of weird, too, is seeing Chris Jericho and Jake Hager in a tag match and working together as a tag team and just choosing to be a tag team. Like, that, that, that really feels kind of weird. Their, you know, middle of the show main event against Private Party was cool. I just couldn't get over most of the time. Like, I just couldn't get over the fact that Jericho has been relegated to tag team duty. When you technically already have a tag team within Inner Circle. I'm not getting it. Does that really want to be a tag team faction of multiple tag teams? Interesting, to say the least, I will say. Um... So I don't know, like, like I said, match, okay, not great, not spectacular, hmm, just kind of weird. Thunder Rosa takes on Ivelisse, Thunder Rosa, I find very interesting, as kind of like a character, a performer, seen her before in NWA, was liking some of what I saw there. I look at this and I say, it's really weird to me that AEW has quite a number of women on their roster. Most fans, rightfully so, complain about how poorly and horribly they feature and book and promote their female talent, their female wrestlers. So in order to fix that, they bring in a champion from another company. That's just weird, man. And then even after the match is over and you have Sheeta come in and she's kind of helping um, Thunder Rosa and giving her her props, like, 
it's really weird. Like you're wasting your national television time to put over somebody else's champion. Like even if you want to say behind closed doors that Thunder Rosa is also signed to some type of AEW contract, you're still representing her as if she is a competitor's champion. Like she is more important than most of the women on your roster. Now to be clear, she is. You're presenting her as if she's better than most of the women on your roster. Again, to be clear, she is. It's just a really, really, really weird decision. Just like bringing in Miro. And latching him on to Kip Sabian and having him start off by being the best man. Like the whole weightlifting thing was just kind of weird. They're talking about the bachelor party. It's just weird. I don't know if I'm really vibing with that. Uh, you had the whole segment with Jake the Snake and Lance Archer, which turns into Taz coming out and talking about alliances and so forth, which just kind of felt like an oddly shoehorned way and excuse to get to Moxley. Um facing off against him and having a six-man tag. Like, it's just kind of weird. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm okay with it, though. Like, at least you say now, you've tried to create a little intensity and a little purpose for Moxley and the one dude. I'm forgetting his name, Will, what, Will whatever the hell it is. Like, I should know his name. I'm drawing a blank right now. Sorry. Didn't get a bunch of sleep last night. It's been tough. Um... And then he brings in Darby Allen, and you're talking about it's going to be Lance Archer, Cage, Starks. Cool. Okay. Like, at least you're building up to next week's show, and you're trying to tie into the story between Archer and Moxley and their title match at the one-year anniversary on October 14th. Even though technically the first show was October 2nd of last year, but who's counting? But then we get to the main event. And like I said, to be honest... Like, this was the thing that had my interest going into the show. This was the thing that I was most anxiously anticipating and wanting to see. Now, anytime I get Luchasaurus to open the show, you know, I'm gravy for a little bit, certainly. You know, because I live for Luchasaurus. I don't have a lot when it comes to wrestling anymore. I got very little. Luchasaurus is one of them. Please do not ever try to take that from me. Thank you. A thank you. But this parking lot fight was spectacular. The visuals were awesome. Like just having all the cars kind of circle around and then you had the people kind of standing in the parking lot. Like that to me inherently felt real because that's what you would see in the real world. Instead of people trying to break up fights as humans, everybody tries to get around and record the fights and look at it and be the awkward looking bystanders. Uh, this felt like more importantly, the exactly the type of hard hitting physical type of beat down, knock down, drag out brawl that it should have been. Like, there were all types of vicious spots here in a match that calls for vicious spots. So it was a really good showcase for Proud and Powerful, and it was a really good showcase for the best friends. One of these great examples to me of where a team wins and a team loses, and yet both teams come out of this match better for it. Now, that, to me, is a great match. And that windshield spot, there were several spots that were sick here. Even at the very beginning when they're shutting the freaking hood, on the damn dude from Proud and Powerful, I can't remember if it was Santana or Ortiz, the damn spot where he goes into the head, into the mirror with his head. Like, you could just feel that. Like, they were doing things that you could feel how painful they were. And then the windshield spot with Trent looked freaking crazy. All that glass going into his back. Like, I can't even freaking imagine. And while I'm not the biggest, like, hardcore wrestling fiend, and I don't need all of these spots in my matches to entertain me, when it makes sense and when, it makes, when it's right and when it's executed properly, I absolutely appreciate the type of performance that I see here. And then the whole thing with Orange Cassidy being in the trunk, like, did dude just sit there in the trunk or in the car hiding the entire time waiting for his moment, waiting for his spot? Fantastic! And even Trent's mom pulling up at the end of the van and flipping the bird in style. The only thing that would have been better if his orange Cassidy went and went over there and slapped a big old sloppy kiss on her. Just like you know Solid Monster would. That fucking MILF hunter. And you know he would too. You know he would. He sat there and savage her with his Solid Monster seduction. Unbelievable. But the parking lot fight was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. And after what felt like a bit of a slog of a show, man, yo, 
that put me in much better spirits and much better mood, and it's got me looking forward to Dynamite next week. So let me know what you thought of this week's show. Let me know what you thought of the parking lot fight. What do you think about them featuring another company's women's champion more prominently than they are anybody really on their roster? Like, what did you like? What did you not like out of this week's show? Remember, I'm the Schlage Daddy, and this is OTR Essential. And as always, it's not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. I'll see you later.